Welcome back to another Impact Lounge Impact Review. I'm your host, Adam, and as always, I'm joined by Ro. Hello, Ro. Hello, Adam. What's up, man? All good at this end. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm feeling a bit under the weather today, but uh, hopefully it won't impact our enthusiasm for this week's show, because let's face it, it was a pretty good show, and we're going to dive into that in a second. But before we do, if this is the first time any of you are swinging by this channel, make sure you do uh, hit the subscribe button. We're already over 3,000 subscribers. We're trying to get to that magical 4,000 very, very quickly. So please do make sure you hit subscribe on YouTube or whatever device you're listening to, whether it's Podbean, iMusic or iTunes, I, Apple Music, I don't know what it's called. I don't do it, but I listen to it on YouTube. So uh, make sure you do hit subscribe. And also, if uh, you like this show, we've got a couple of uh, colleagues out there who run their own podcasts as well. Uh, so, Ro, tell us a bit about those. Yeah, um, the Wrestling per Personified podcast, they do a tremendous job covering Impact, um, the Impact Review as well. And then also for people on Facebook, uh, be sure to check out the Impact Fan Zone. A lot of stuff goes on there. So, you know, like and uh, share your comments on Impact. Yeah, and just on that note, once again, thanks for your comments that you do keep leaving us and answering our questions. Uh, it was also nice to see after people listened to last week's show, they're asking, where was the Eli Drake interview? Uh, if you haven't already caught that, it's now up on the site. Um, I was delighted I got got about 15, 16, 17 minutes, something like that with him. And the guy truly was awesome. You know, I had a chat with him before and after we did the recording, but he was such a, a laid back dude. And uh, I was going to say cat then. I don't know why I would say laid back cat, but there you go. Um, uh, he's, he's just a, a genuinely sound guy. And uh, if you haven't heard it, check it out. He, he's not in character. He's just being himself. And he comes up with a load of stuff. And, and the good thing, I think the reason why I've always liked him as, as a performer, uh, listening to this interview, I think he shares a lot of the same views on wrestling and how he performs is the kind of thing that I enjoy to see as well. So, yeah, get a chance. Check that out. Leave us your comments. And this week, once again, we'll be asking questions as we go through the podcast. If you've got anything you want to ask us or any comments on, on our views, let us know in the comments section and we'll do our best to bring it up. Was there anything from last week's uh, comments that you wanted to mention, Ro? Um, Put you on the spot there, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> now, I was just thinking, and, I, and I'll, I'll point this out. You know, this, and as we get into this show, I will say, and I know I've been talking about the commentary, to me, it doesn't matter as much. I will say Sanjay is starting to grow on me as a commentator. You know, certain little things where he, you know, where he um, is explaining in matches and whatnot. Like, he's starting to grow on me. So well, I, I'm starting to enjoy, you know, to hear his commentary. Well, that's good. I'm beginning to brainwash you into, into my way of thinking. That's good <laughs> Can I just say, by the way, I thought this week both of them were fantastic. And they, I mean, you mentioned it before that they can make a good match great, you know, by, you know, really uh, hyping up the action. And I thought in some of the matches this week, they were fantastic. They really elevated it and really got excited about the matches. And that's what you want from a commentary team. So, yeah, um, just before we dive into the show, one other thing that I, I quite liked about this show um, was the kind of, uh, back, not backstage, what is it? You know, where the two commentators were stood in front of um, a row of screens uh, ch chatting about what's coming up and things like that. I quite like that. It made it feel more like um, a TV newsroom or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, they normally, you see uh, things like that when it's leading up to a pay-per-view. What they'll do is, you know, normally they'll be like in a studio and they're uh, previewing the, the matches. But yeah, I, I like this. I, I thought you know, maybe this is something they can do in the foreseeable future that way, you know, because a lot of times we hear them talking, but we never see them on the screen. And obviously we know since it's so taped in advance and sometimes they make changes like, you know, it won't if you if you show them on the screen, it might not necessarily match to what's currently happening. But, yeah, there were the them in the studio reviewing the matches. Um, I thought that was great. Yeah. All right. Well, let's first of all, before we dive into the show, what did you think of it overall? Yeah, I thought it was great, man. And what was so funny was, you know, once uh, Impact ended, I was like, man, I can't wait for the pay-per-view. Then I said, well, one, the pay-per-view is until April. Two, uh, Crossroads is uh, uh, on a Thursday, not a Sunday. And then three, you know, it's going to be one of those uh, Impact specials. But just that feeling, you know, how they were, uh, the whole, the buildup of it all. I, I thought that was just excellent, and this was a nice go-home show. You normally don't see that when you're talking about that show before a big event, 
But yeah, this delivered. Yeah, I thought so as well. And it was interesting. We were talking before we came on today what we actually thought about the show. And we kind of both agreed that um, at first it, the show kind of washed over us. But when we thought back to what was in it, it was actually an excellent show. And I, and I think it, it goes to show that if you do start with a lacklustre first match opening segment, then it could have a bit of an impact on the whole show. And, and it was a real shame because overall the show was excellent, but it started off quite poorly. And we're going to get into that in a second. But yeah, next week, I think they've done really well to hype it up, including the graphic bits. But everything about this this week felt right. Um, last week, I, I moaned about there was too many matches and not enough backstage segments. I think this week they got the balance just right. If, if nothing else, they... They maybe did a bit too much talking stuff, but that, that's the kind of storyline progression that I love about wrestling. I love that kind of stuff. But there's a lot more of it this week, a lot more storyline driven as opposed to wrestling. And overall, I thought it was excellent. But anyway, let's let's dive into it. So I've already said I thought uh, the opening segment match was was pretty poor. What, what were your views on it, bro? I just found it too, too much comedy on EC3's end, the EC3 versus Tyrus. Um, I felt... In this match, it looked like it was a way to kind of uh, focus on Tyrus as more of a, a challenger in the foreseeable future, you know, from whichever championship. And commentary did a excellent job, you know, putting that out there that, you know, what brought him back to Impact. You know, he's here now. He wants to win championships because, you know, in the past, we really never knew what Tyrus's role was outside of him, you know, being a bodyguard and whatnot. But on EC3s, and I, I just felt like it took too long for it to really like get into its groove you know he was doing a lot of the stuff outside and I, it's just from his time in impact i don't remember even you know when he was an, initially a hill um i don't remember him doing all that stuff you know it was more the dirty dirty tactics but i mean tyrus gets the win i mean which is good since he's gonna be with us and um yeah that's pretty much it that's all i gotta say the one other thing that was noticeable about this match, it seemed to go on forever. Um, it, it seemed like a really long, drawn-out match. And I think it's going back to what you said, that a lot of it was being comically hammed up by EC3. It, it, it just it just didn't hit home, did it, at all, this match. It, it didn't come out of nowhere, because obviously they had their, their, their bit of a confrontation last week, which did seem to come out of nowhere. Um, but, yeah, I'm just glad it's over, to be honest. And, and the quicker... Now that EC3 goes, and I'm guessing that's going to be in the next two, three, four weeks, because we all know he turns up on NXT. Last week, I try not to say anything about spoilers, but I think we all know that he's going. Uh, the quicker he goes now, it, it looks like he's already mentally checked out. Um, and after me saying that he looked better than he has done in months recently, uh, I, I thought this match was, was just dreadful. And it's a shame because it, it, you know, it didn't drag down the rest of the show, but it, it just started off on quite a negative note. Anyway, uh, let's move on. So then we had Joseph Parker talking to Grandma Jenny. Uh, well, not really much to say about this other than, obviously, once again, they're hamming up. But it's good that they carry on reminding us of what the storyline is. And, you know, some of these segments sometimes get criticised because, you know, they just throw away things. But it's just a little gentle reminder, you know, of, of what's coming up. So for me, no problem with it. Uh, any views on it? You know, I don't, I don't remember that this, uh, I must have not caught, caught this part. I apologize. That's all right. It was just that uh, he was talking to Grandma Jenny on the phone, uh, saying that he's going to go out there and take on Congo Kong himself uh, and ask if she believes in him. And, and you don't hear her, but he said, no, I, I don't believe in me either. Uh, so <laughs> it, it, it was just, as I said, a bit of a throwaway nonsense stuff. Uh, we then moved on to, um, well, I don't know what to call it, but, you know, this shaky cam hazy footage style thing that OVE does, which I quite like. You know, it's that uh, kind of found footage kind of camera work that you see in horror films, you know what I mean? So uh, they did that where they were showing a split, uh, a torn up image of Eddie Edwards and then OVE started doing their usual stick. Yeah, I, I like this because it's a different form of like kind of um, a backstage interview and it's unique for them and their, their whole get up. Yeah, so, you know, they've certainly got their own visual style, haven't they? And you know, instantly, it's going to be an OVE segment when you see that camera work. So from that point of view, I think the, the, the OVE branding on, on Impact has been very, very good and very successful. Uh, once again, it just, you know, it really does say Sammy Callahan is the only guy in this group that really matters. 
and as you get through the three of them, they get lesser and lesser importance with regards to them as their charisma diminishes. But yeah, Sammy Callahan has grown on me, um, and he and he does look like someone who actually could be quite hard in real life as well, as opposed to Johnny Impact, who I could take down with one arm behind my back. <laughs> that's, that's another story again, right? Okay, so um, after that we had the aforementioned Sonjay and Josh preview in front of their screens talking about some of the matches that are coming up um as i said i quite like what they're doing here you know uh and I, I think they should have been doing this for a long time and and it feels like they're really beginning to get their visual style now this new impact creative team and production team I, i'm liking where they're going with this yeah you know the the one thing though i wonder because i don't know if maybe it was something bq had covered but is josh right now is he just kind of in stem or is this common to, is this going to be the commentary team moving forward or do they look to replace these guys just because you know they're i know everyone might have different opinions but they're starting to build chemistry and like like you said you know this uh episode you know they both did uh relatively well and it's like you kind of hate to break break that chemistry up and then you know have to bring up board a new commentary team you know they find something that you know that you can keep in place Absolutely. I mean, I hope they do keep it together. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just have to wait to see how it plays out. But you're quite right. They're beginning to get chemistry. And uh, yeah, they're, they're finding their roles very, very well in it at the moment. So yeah, let's hope it does continue. Right. OK, next match we had uh, El Hijo de Fantasma versus Braxton Sutter. Who's that guy? I'm sure I saw him in the Impact Zone once. Anyway, he was back on our screens this week uh, facing uh, Fantasma. I thought this was uh, a really good match. Yeah, me too. I what I, what I liked was obviously see them using Braxton Sutter, and um, we've seen some character development with Braxton Sutter in this match. You know, which is crazy because you know I can't recall the last time we've seen him. You know, let alone wrestle. And Phantasm was always awesome. Um, I'll say it before and I'll say it again. I think him and Ishimori out of the partnerships Impact has had, these got to be the two guys. The two guys where. I wouldn't. I don't mind them putting on putting championships on them because I, you know, think they're great wrestlers and they do great work when they come to Impact. You know, they give it their all. They don't shortchange us. Because I know sometimes it's been a criticism of some wrestlers where they limit themselves when they're wrestling in Impact versus when they wrestle somewhere else. You know, they go all balls to the wall. So uh, yeah, but yeah, this, this was a great great match. I also like the way that. Uh... Phantasma came to the ring with his other title from a different promotion. Uh, I quite like that and that they're playing up on that. I think it really adds credibility to a the partnerships that they've got, but also the talent, you know, can be shown to be um, a, a really good, you know, character, a, a, a proper athlete, a proper threat without actually having to hold an impact title. So I quite like the way they're doing that. And I think it's a, it's a good move. But you're quite right as well. We were talking about commentary a second ago and the Braxton Sutter development. You know, if it wasn't for the fact that the commentators were saying, oh, he's got a handful of tights, that's not usually like him, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, it would have been harder to turn Braxton Hill. You know, and the commentary once again played their part in this match, which I thought was great. Yeah, well, I think, too, what the follow up that uh, promo, I thought that was one I was like, OK, I hope they do something with this moving forward. This just isn't a one off. And then even later on in the show, as we get into, but the promo where he's talking about, you know, that he didn't even get an entrance and, you know, talking about how Ali ruins everything. Just that promo alone before he got decapitated by Brian Cage. <laughs> but um, with that promo alone, I hope, <clears throat> excuse me, I hope they find something to do with him. You know, even if it's something in the mid card. You know, and he can be a mid-card heel or whatever the case may be. But uh, that's what I liked. And that's what comes to show you with Impact. Some of these people that aren't being utilized, all it takes is, you know, uh, this creative team can find a way to pull somebody who's been on the shelf. And, you know, now it has me interested in Braxton Sutter again. Not that I wasn't in the past, but, you know, I don't remember seeing that much of him. But, in, you know, this uh, this matches, you know, with the whole heel turn. It's like, I want to see what happens next with him. Uh, absolutely. And I think BQ quite often talk about, you know, he really writes Braxton Sutter. Um, so it, it was really good, you know. So that's it, huh? This is Braxton Sutter on Impact, you know. Didn't even get an entrance music. Yeah, uh, brilliant. I love it. I thought it was brilliant. So, 
yeah, good, good on him. It was a shame that he got destroyed by Brian Cage a few moments later. Uh, cause it kind of, you know, lost out on some of the impact. And you just wonder where he's going to go with this, because obviously he was featured a little bit later on. And once again, made to look a little bit foolish. But uh, hopefully they won't turn him into a comedy character who just... Well, I was going to say like a Heath Slater who's just there to get beaten up each week. Hopefully he can do something, like you said, maybe in the X Division, maybe find a tag partner along the way. Because he's obviously got some chops on the mic. So, uh, yeah. But as we said, Brian Cage came down, um, did mince his words. Uh, in fact, I don't think we've heard him speak yet, have we? Nah, and you know what? Maybe that's the way to go right now because, you know, he's still in the early stages of his push. Like I said, I I wouldn't be opposed to them going the uh, Goldberg-esque route. Just have them just run through, you know, some people and then along the way face some of the bigger names. So, but yeah, right now, yeah, he just came down, hit the lariat, and then um, his move that he's calling the Drill Claw, which is the Steiner screwdriver. Brutal. <laughs> It is, and everything he does just looks like it really, really hurts. Um, I was going to say, he did a, a, a lariat attempt in this match, but thinking about it, I think it was Sammy Callahan, so I'll come back to that as I move later on. Anyway, we moved on to Matt Seidel. I got his name right this week. Uh, Matt Seidel, who did a little vignette back, uh, promo package, but then went backstage with Mackenzie Mitchell, uh, where Ishimori turned up. Um, once again, this got me laughing, and... For all the wrong reasons, but it did get me laughing. I'll, I'll say why in a second. But what did you think about this? Well, I like that we got Ishimori answering the challenge because, you know, remember we talked about last week. And I know they had advertised it towards the end, but I was all like, you know, what why, what uh, incentive would Ishimori have to defend his championship unless it's going to be a uh, title versus title match? So the fact that we had him, you know, accept the challenge, but also, you know, invoke that Seidel puts the Grand Championship match, I mean, Grand, uh, grand ch Championship title on the line. Uh, I thought I thought that was great. I, I really like the fact that, I, for some reason, in my mind, when, when I pictured the way that Ishimori threw out his insult, he's obviously got a very, very limited vocabulary. But it just amuses me to think that, you know, he's been taking English lessons and one of the first words that he's learned is douchebag. <laughs> um, you know, but as I said, it had me laughing, you know, that we've never heard the guy speak in, in, in English at all. And then suddenly uh, he comes out with uh, uh, Sadal, you're a douchebag or whatever. So anyway, uh, like we said last week, it's good to see that they're, they're listening. They're thinking about it. Why would he put the title on the line unless uh, Seidel's title was on the line? So looks like we've got what we wanted to. But a fun little segment. Move the storyline on, which is what we've been asking for and what our comments last week uh, on, the, on the, the show review. People are agreeing with us that it's about continuity and they're finally learning their lesson about building storylines, not having to do it all, but at least just keeping us hooked uh, on things as they go on. Right. Uh, Congo Kong with Jimmy Jacobs versus Joseph Park. Uh, <laughs> this was fun. I quite enjoyed this. And I know it's not going to be winning one of Meltzer's five star wrestling match awards. But it was fun for while it lasted. Um, any comments before I go on and say what I thought? Um, yeah, I mean, it was harmless. I just think it's more just to build up the eventual Abyss return. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it was what it was supposed to be. Congo Kong running through Joseph Park, and that's what he did. The, the, the part that, once again, you know, I, I'm not... A huge fan. If, if, if there was two hours of just comedy all the way through, and EC3 is a perfect example of this, I thought it was awful. But there's sometimes with certain characters it works quite well, and usually it is with Kong Kong, but the bit where Joseph Park headbutted him and came off worse, once again, I, I just love things like that in these stupid matches. You know, I have no problem as part of a bigger show. Uh, but once again, I, I, was, I was in stitches watching that. I don't know if you caught it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you, well, you know, the whole point with his character is, you know, he doesn't know know how to wrestle much. So, <laughs> and then especially against, you know, a, a larger guy like Congo Kong, you know, it's, it was funny. But yeah, it just seems seems that you know we're waiting for the return of Abyss. Yep, and and I think as I said, you know, I don't know if it's, it's not a crossroads, is it? They're not having that match, are they? I think that's maybe for for the pay per view later on. But uh, have we got anything going on next week with these two, or is it just uh, uh, see what happens? Yeah, I think it's more of a see see what happens. I mean, maybe we'll get some kind of. Uh, I mean, I'm sure Congo Kong will and uh, Jimmy Jacobs. They'll you know 
you know, do the shake where they're, you know, trying to get Abyss to return. So but we'll have to see. I wonder what the plan is with Jimmy Jacobs going forward, because uh, I don't know if you guys uh, who are listening to this now have listened to the teleconference of Jimmy Jacobs on, which was excellent, by the way. Um, but, you know, he, he's obviously a very, very talented guy and he's doing great work to make Congo Kong interesting. But at some point, he's going to have to do something because he, he's not really doing much. And he, he seems like he's got so much more to offer. Well, I think right now, and I, mean, I know what you're talking about just for, as far as the foreseeable future. I think the goal right now, maybe I'm maybe I'm alone in this, and you know, listeners, you know, you can share your comments. I think the goal is to get Congo Kong into the main event, and I think once you get him get him into the main event and establish him, because the main event, you know, right now, you know, it's starting to grow. But when's the last time we kind of had that? that giant i don't know how tall congo kong is you know relatively tall guy but when's the last time we've had that in the main event so i think once congo kong gets to that level then you know maybe we could see him and jimmy jacobs breaking apart but i think for right now him ma- managing uh, congo kong it serves well okay we'll we'll agree to disagree on that one but uh, i know what you're saying i c- can you see congo kong in the main event really I, I don't know if i can if i'm being honest i can see him maybe holding the likes of uh well the grand championship or a mid-belt title of some sort but i don't know i just can't see him ever being seen as a credible challenger for the the you know the world or the global title whatever it's called um but let us know your thoughts in the comments below this is why we do this to see what you think and to see who you agree with uh whether it's row on kong for a main event push or me mid card push let's see your thoughts and i realize i'm putting words in your mouth there bro i know you didn't <laughs> say you want to see him pushed but you, you could imagine him in there okay yeah All right. it, it, like ma- mainly what i was just saying and then we'll move on is it's kind of like you know when you have your main event not everybody in it is obviously you know gonna win win the title but a lot of times you have various challengers of you know shapes and sizes i guess i'm just thinking about it is you know i look at the main event scene and you know and even like with brian cage's arrival eventually when he gets to that point you know we haven't really had a great mixture of main event talent everybody's kind of been like the same look so to speak so to have somebody who's tall like that and then you know like brian cage you know you know who's just jacked to the gills like, I just thought, you know, I, that's something I could probably see. But, hey, we can agree to disagree. That's no, no. OK. <laughs> I, I think I think it would be good, actually, because, I mean, l- assuming that Austin Aries is still title holder at that point, it would be a good victory f- and a good actual feud for Austin Aries. Someone who you would think him being so small is not going to be able to compete against someone like that. Uh, but and if he does what he does, his muscle buster on him, it will look awesome. So, yeah, I actually can see that. But you, you're quite right. I suppose the only wild card in this is Tyrus. Um, do you think he'll come, you know, maybe be that guy as well? Because obviously they're talking about him having a push. You know what? And and I could be wrong because the, the one thing with Impact, man, and they really, I think if it's somebody they want to get behind, they get behind. There's no kind of like, you know, where they pigeonhole people. Because you look at somebody like a Eric Young, since I've been following this company, I would have never thought he would have won the world title when he was with the company, but he did. And, you know, his push, it was decent. So, but if, if you ask me, I, if I, I would think Tyrus is silly, I could see maybe the grand championship. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't see the, 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 the world title, but I, I could be wrong though. Um, just while you mentioned Eric Young there, I, I was always a huge fan of his. And I remember many, many moons ago, I used to do another podcast. And, and one of the ones that we did was when Eric Young won that title. I was claiming that Eric Young was better than CM Punk and Brian, uh, Daniel, Daniel Bryan rolled together. Uh, I still have people commenting on that to this day to me saying how wrong or how drunk must I have been to have said that. But anyway, <laughs> I, 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 I do like Eric Young is what I'm trying to get at. Right. Talking of um, smaller bearded uh, guys who could be very, very funny. My favorite part of the show this week. Uh, we had the cult of Lee having their cabana party or whatever it's called uh, backstage. I really, really enjoyed this. Again, it's just, I just like these guys. I mean, you could, as I said before, you could have them reading, you know, uh, a telephone direction. And I'd find it entertaining. Th- these two together are, are brilliant. And Caleb has really come into his own as well. But his look, everything about him is just getting better and better. So, so this was really good. I enjoyed this. 
Yeah, it's like, you know what, they're really coming to our, to their own. Like, in some ways, you kind of feel like, man, why they take so long to pull the trigger on this? Because, you know, we've seen, especially after um, Trevor Lee had lost the X Division championship, you know, they were kind of like loosely tagging and whatnot. But now they feel really feel like a you would think they're an established tag team. And, uh, you know, with these little segments and stuff, it's, it's excellent. I think the Cold Elite's here to stay. Yeah, I hope so. And uh, the only thing I didn't like about this is they made them look a little bit weak um, with, with the way that they were ambushed and, you know, drowned kind of thing. But at the same time, you know, I suppose LAX have got to get a bit of uh, revenge for what's been going on. But at the same time, you know, it seemed a bit too easy. I would like to have seen them escape, you know, the ambush in some kind of form uh, to come up a little bit stronger. But anyway, it was good stuff. And do you know what? Uh, as I said, these two could, could just do anything. Best part of the show. And I think some of the commentators last week also agreed with me that, that you know, it's the, their favourite act on uh, Impact at the moment. All right. Uh, moving on from this, we went into another backstage uh, Alberto El Patron message to Austin Aries and Johnny Impact. I felt quite indifferent to this, if I'm being honest, because it just seems like the same stuff over and over from Alberto at the moment. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I didn't really care for this that much. I liked the promo, but I didn't like what the promo was about. I don't know if that makes much sense, but I think had he was just talking about, you know, I'm going to do what it takes to get back the title. Fine. But we're kind of seeing it seems like. Like, whomever's champion, you know, he's cutting a promo, you know, I should be champion. And it's like he's getting opportunities and not um, capitalizing on these opportunities. They got to really find him something to do. Like, when we're, we're seeing, you know, this, and we'll get into this, and I'll use an example later on in the show, where you got to be able to put some of these guys in fuse that don't revolve around, or in knockouts as well, that don't revolve around the title. And I think since El Patron's arrival, everything's been, you know, circled around the title. He's held the title, okay, and then for whatever, re you know, his reasons, you know, he they had a, he was stripped of the title. I thought that feud that he had with Johnny Impact was excellent. It gave him something to do away from the title. That's what they got to continue to do because we know, you know, somewhere down the road, he's probably going to regain it or he's going to get another title shot, and that's fine. But – Maybe, you know, engage in a feud with a, a moose, you know, somebody else work down the card just a tad bit. You know, why Why does everything have to be circled around the title with him? Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. And the, sh the sad thing about the Johnny Impact uh, Alberto feud, it didn't really, to me, feel like it had a big payoff. You know, they had one final match and that's it. And he kind of disappeared from it. And I don't know if that's more to do with, you know, his personal life, not being at the tapings. I don't know. But it, it seemed to me it they kind of missed a longer feud that they could have gone with that one. But uh, it is what it is. And um, yeah, uh, we'll see where he goes. Who could he feud with? That's a good question. I mean, I don't think someone like Braxton Sutter's big enough. You know, I reckon even someone like KM could really fill that role. You know, uh, another big guy who can most probably put on a good match. Moose, as you said, Moose isn't really doing anything at the moment. And he's being groomed for the top spot at some point. I think... He, you, you predicted uh, Slammiversary. I said Bound for Glory. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But Moose was uh, was missing, wasn't he, this week, from memory. And that's about the only character I think was missing. Anyway, moving on. Hanaya versus Rosemary. And the battle of the entrances, um, because both of them have got such a good distinctive look. It's a real shame that Hanaya's not sticking around, because I think... She had potential to be a good character in the knockout division. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it kind of makes you wonder too. I know the I, f I forgot what the reason why. I want to say it was something about she had refused to um, take uh, take a pin fall against a wrestler, and then I think some backstage stuff. This kind of makes you wonder, you know, why weren't they able to work that out? But then again, too, you look at it, was it worth it? You know, so yeah, it's unfortunate, but. Uh, you know, Rosemary, man, I mean, I don't want to say this was a squash because Anaya, she got, you know, some offense in, but Rosemary did what she was uh, supposed to do. And uh, that spear, did you catch that spear that Rosemary hit? It was excellent, wasn't it? It was really, man. really quite good, yeah. <laughs> You know, and and you know, and that that is one thing I noticed with Impact the Spear. That's why for you know a guy like Lashley, you know that being his finisher, you know you see various people use the spear 
Um, and, and, and not just with the spear. There's other moves that I notice that people use as finishers. Other people use as moves. Um, but yeah, that spear that I was like, wow. And then you know she hits the red wedding. Um, but go ahead. I'll, I'll let you get in, get into your your thoughts as to what happened after. Yeah, well, well, first of all, the match was very, very quick, but while it was going, it was excellent, you know, and that's why it's a shame that, that Hanaya has disappeared, but I was actually really surprised how quick it was, and I, and I can't imagine at this point they knew that she would be going. Uh, I think this is the way it was always planned, always booked, uh, but it seemed strange it was so quick, uh, but, but there you go. Anyway, after the match, uh, we had uh, Taya Valkyrie, uh, Valkyrie, Valkyrie uh, come out. And, uh, yeah, they had a bit of a face-off. And the one thing I'll say is, during the match, before before Taya came out, the crowd was super into it, really shouting, really screaming for Rosemary. It seemed like, you know, it was fantastic. But as soon as Taya came out, it was like crickets. You know, it was, honestly, it was so quiet at some points. And it made me uncomfortable, and it took me out of the moment, because it was so quiet and awkward and uncomfortable for a little while during the... Uh, the face-off between the two. It, it was bizarre. And I like these two, but I don't know that this just didn't work for me afterwards. You know, I wonder if, cause you think about it before, you know, that whole issue where she didn't, wasn't at the Canada tapings, you know, you figure Taya, she was still kind of getting her footing in the company. So, I mean, do you think maybe some of these people don't remember her? I don't know. It wasn't that long ago, was it? I mean, okay. From a TV type, well, what was it about three months, if that, maybe three, four months? It doesn't seem like it was that long ago she was on our TV screens. And, you know, it, it just seems crazy to me that, you know, with the entrance that she's got and the push that she had beforehand, people would remember this feud. But uh, and certainly when you see around ringside, you see the same faces all the time. So you know that they're going and watching every impact. You know, the guy with the EC3 suit, uh, the girl with the big afro, you know, for example, who you see every week, you know, at ringside when it's in Orlando. So I, I can't imagine that people didn't know who she was. It, it just really seemed strange that the Hanaya interactions were super over. And as soon as Ty came out, it just went very, very quiet. And don't get me wrong. I, I thought it was all right. The face off the road to Valhalla on the ramp was, was brutal. Great. You know, quite interested to see where it goes. I just hope that we don't get a repeat of the, the crowd interaction in the next match, because I think they deserve better than that. Yeah. Now, do you think maybe the timing, because, you know, the post match before we had Ty uh, um, come come out, we had Rosemary stating that, you know, her aspirations for regaining the Knockouts Championship, which I find excellent. Like, you know, uh, I know MBQ did a video on this about the whole interaction uh, for you guys to check out between uh, Rosemary and Taya. But he was just talking about how Rosemary, you know, as a late had, uh, you know, been losing a lot. So now this focus on her chasing the championship, which is good. But and then you have Taya come out. The one thing with Taya, and this was my first time hearing her speak. <laughs> it's funny. It's like one of those uh, instances where you know, the way that they look and then how they sound, it didn't match. Like, the way she speaks, she kind of came across as um, kind of like that Valley Girl type. And I just feel like, you know, the, the way she sounds doesn't necessarily fit the character. Not that it's a, any big deal, but I like the fact that they're going to refocus on this feud because, you know, I know we were supposed to get their red wedding at a Bound for Glory. But this gives both of them something to do. It reintegrates Taya back into the uh, knockouts scene. And then, uh, you know, Rosemary gives her some a feud before she you know, goes back and challenges for the knockout championship. Yeah, I, I mean, I have no problem with the feud and it makes perfect sense because we all wanted to see where it went. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I did, the only thing I think the only loser out of all this was Hanaya because she was ultimately made to look like uh, a bit of a chump in all of this. And it's a shame because it looked like she had a bit of potential, but you know, you can't change someone's attitude, can you? Anyway, right. let's, let's know your thoughts and uh, yeah, well, we'll see what you will comment on your thoughts next week. Right. Uh, we had the flashback next. Once again, UK didn't get this. So it was Lashley versus Eddie Edwards. Anything you want to comment on? Um, they're continuing to showcase these flashbacks with people who are on the roster at high points, too. And this was one of them, Eddie Edwards defeating Lashley for the world title. You know, I remember his his uh, the, the only thing I'll say is his world title run. It was random, but 
for me, I like random. I thought that was cool. They, you know, tried something new. But, uh, you know, so many people were against him being champion. But uh, he, he had a decent reign. So that was all I had to comment. Cool. So just my thoughts. I, I didn't particularly like the title. I did like the shock value of him winning it. But, yeah, I thought it was a pretty nothing title reign, to be honest. Um, but yeah, that's, that's why we're here, to have opposing views. All right, let's see what you say on this next section then, because uh, I, I said that Caleb and Cult of Lee were my favourite parts. Weddings are always done terribly in wrestling, and we always know they're going to go wrong. But for some reason, this segment, I loved it. It was stupid. It, uh, you know, everything about it was ridiculous. But, uh, you know, for me, it was great. I loved it. I really, really enjoyed this. And if any of you have saw this and thought, oh, I'm going to wind it on or, or whatever, uh, before we dive into each individual part of the ceremony go back and watch km's face throughout this whole segment he is honestly comedy gold this guy his expressions were awesome and if you if you if, if you're listening to this man you think what am i on about just go back before you make your comments in the section below watch km throughout it and you'll have a new appreciation of this section because he was brilliant anyway uh what did you think of this bro it was nicely done if i had to say one thing just minor grip i felt like there was a little bit stalling and what i mean by that is remember when uh he uh when km was talking about if there's anyone who objects and then you had laurel van ness keep insisting yes 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 and normally for you know the weddings when they ask that the person will just come out but she kept insisting and and that was the thing that was just like why did she keep ex is insisting what did she want to just hurry up and you know, do go on with the marriage. But uh, yeah, I liked it. And I mean, we got Braxton Sutter coming back out and I, I thought this was funny where it, where he was talking about he made a mistake and he was trying to rekindle something with uh, Laurel Van Ness and then, you know, she shoots him down. So that's, you know, two instances we've seen uh, Braxton Sutter, um, you know, I don't want to say be looked foolish, but, you know, he <laughs> he gets uh, beaten by, and then he he's, he was even selling the beating from uh, Brian Cage earlier with the neck brace. But uh, yeah, I, I I like this. But yeah, that was just my thing. They they kept insisting the whole objection. I felt kind of felt like that they were waiting for the inevitable uh, alley run in, which we got. But uh, there was one bit that was a bit silly. Well, one bit that was silly. What am I about? They marrying a belt to a woman. How can I say one bit? Um, but there was one part of it which didn't make sense. But uh, just selling the the Braxton sort of thing. I, I love the way KM just went epic fail, bro. <laughs> 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 Honestly, as I said, go back and check KM if you haven't seen it. But yeah, I, I mean, I think the whole thing was you know they were trying to entice Ali out. And I think f from a storyline point of view, I think that's what. Uh, Laurel was trying to do, you know, because she, she wasn't actually trying to get married, she was just trying to draw her out. But the thing that didn't make any sense, that Braxton came out, effectively dumping Ali in the ring and saying, no, he loves Laurel, blah, blah, blah. And yet, we're led to believe afterwards that Ali was at the stage, you know, dressed up as a cameraman or whatever it was, the whole time, and she was okay with Braxton coming out and dumping her, but uh, as soon as she could jump uh, Laurel later on, it was, you know, it didn't make sense if you sort of say, you know, surely she should have reacted to to Braxton being out there and dumping her. But anyway, uh, it was what it was. I, I, I enjoyed it. You know, it's silly. But I don't mind mixing up wrestling shows with, with stuff like this. You know, it can't all be wrestling all the time. I think you've got to have a bit of uh, drama and, and silliness in there as well. So it was good. And um, yeah, I'm guessing we'll, we'll see another title match coming up. Yep. Yeah. Uh, um. Okay. Uh, then we had, um, before the main event, we had one more final talky segment which was impact and austin aries hyping the upcoming impact world championship match on next week's show once again I, you know i think they've done a, a really bang up job on these these backstage promos it's something that impact have always done very very well and i think that's something that they always have done better than wwe is doing these kind of uh you know uh, video packages yeah, this one, this one was uh, where what stu stood out to me was uh, when Austin Aries had mentioned all the opportunities that Johnny Impact has received, and he's been yet to capture the championship. So it kind of makes you wonder what what will Impact do in this match to finally capture the Impact World Championship? Has me looking forward to it. 
I don't know if they if this is at crossroads next week, but I don't know if they've already started to build up to the pay per view. Uh, do we know who's going to be facing whoever the champion is at that point, or is that still to be decided in storyline? Yeah, it's to, it's to still be decided. Everything that was set up was pretty much um, for cross the crossroads uh, um, event. I know we got Feast of Fire coming up, so I'm guessing someone will get a target shot at that point. But do you think that potentially, and, and this is non-spoiler, this, I haven't read this or anything like that. I'm just doing a bit of, uh, not, not even fantasy booking, just a bit of uh, thinking out loud here. But could they possibly have brought Austin Aries back to be a temporary title holder, just so that the ex-WWE guy, Johnny Impact, doesn't take it from a impact talent and Eli Drake if you sort of mean so it doesn't hurt Eli in the long run do you think the, that maybe Austin's been brought in just to basically be a transitional champ or do you think that's me just looking for conspiracy theory that's not there I think they looked at Austin Aries is because I mean essentially you're saying the same thing even though I know he had a, a great uh, run his first go around or his second go around I should say with uh, impact was TNA then um, but you know, you're still essentially talking about the same thing because he had went over to the to the other company, then to come back and win win the uh, the um, Impact World Title. Whereas Johnny Impact was in uh, Lucha Underground, I believe, and then he came over. So um, the thing I think with uh, the whole Austin Aries, I do think when he drops his drops the title, it might be to whomever wins the uh, Feast or Fire uh, the World Title Shot um, contract. But I think they probably did that just to kind of because, you know, he's a he's a big name and, you know, he was successful under the old TN, TNA umbrella. So kind of like to give that, you know, you know, new regime. Here's our new here's our guy, so to speak. So wh whomever beats him is going to really get that big rub. But I'm I'm at the point, man. I mean, I'm ready for them to pull the trigger on Johnny Impact because. They made a, you know, Austin Aries made a point like this. This guy has been having match after match for the title. And, you know, at some point you have to decide like or take a chance if you want to put it on him or not. I think if you were to put on put the belt on impact right when he arrived, it would have been a problem. But he's been with the company long enough now where I think you could put the belt on him and it'll be OK. You see, I don't think that they will put the belt on him at this point. I don't know. I might be wrong. Um, but. I don't actually want to see the belt on him. Uh, I would rather that they maybe even go down the X Division route with him uh, because he could add a lot to the X Division with his moveset. I think it would work really well. And even at some point saying, you know, you're not getting another title shock. So you've had loads and loads and loads and eventually going down the option C, the Austin Aries route, ironically, you know, of winning Destination X or whatever it may be and uh, and having a, a title challenge that way. That's what I'd like to see because I... I don't think he deserves a title. Um, I just don't think he's that complete a wrestler at the moment. Well, maybe not wrestler, but he just doesn't look authentic enough to, to be the top guy. He, isn't, uh, he needs to do something different. So hopefully he won't win it. And if they do want to put the title on him, hopefully it'll be a little way down the line just yet. All right. Uh, oh, by the way, let us know your thoughts in the comments below, as always. Right. Moving on to the main event, the one that's been talked about for weeks and weeks and weeks uh, after the actual tapings of it, something that's been heavily publicised. And can I just say, by the way, uh, before we, we, we finish on this week's show and talk about this match, uh, the viewership this week was up. Uh, it's was it something like 376,000 this week, which is the biggest in, in pretty much nine, ten months, uh, certainly in a, in, a, in a good long time. It's, it's been one of the biggest rated shows for, for, for Impact. Do you think it was because of the ending of this match that people were tuning in, uh, Ro? Do you, do, or do you think it was just because it was a good show? A combination of both. I mean, you never know with these ratings, man. I mean, there's times where the shows and, and, and you know, everyone has a different opinion and that's all right. I mean, a lot of times, too, you got to think of what else is going on that um, on Thursday nights. You know, if you have, you know, like, say, I know you got NBA or, you know, some other thing going on. I think that affects it. But you really never know because there are shows that you know are excellent, but then the ratings don't reflect. And then you got shows where it's just like, OK, it was OK. And, you know, then you see this big, you know, this big hike. But I think with this, it was a combination between both. I want to say it was. I don't, 
three hundred sixty five thousand with a um I forgot what it what the rating it got, but um it's great. I mean, in it's well deserved. I'm glad that the work that creative and these wrestlers are are doing, you know, trying to entertain us fans on our television screens. It's uh, paying dividends, man, and and I like that. So when I seen the rating, I, I, I was really happy with that. Bravo. Now, can I just say about this match? I thought it w- it was awesome. Once again, another pay per view quality match. Uh, the commentary sold it like a, a boss really did. And the other thing is as well. This was the main event. And if you'd gone back a year ago and said the main event of the show was going to be uh, Eddie Edwards versus Sammy Callahan, and it's going to be awesome, I wouldn't have believed you. I would have gone, you're talking crazy. But this was really, really good. Some brutal moves, really quick, fast, strong, you know, hard hitting stuff in there. And uh, it, it just looked like a real fight this did. And of course, obviously, there was a bit of a, not a tragic ending, but, you know, a, a miscue at the end. But I, I just thought the, the whole match was awesome. Yeah, it it really showcased, um, you know, and this just like, I mean, obviously, this one showcased Callahan better than when he had faced Lashley. But um, I think they got big plans for Callahan. I think right now, as far as, you know, with OV, he's going to be the focus right now. And, I mean, you know, you still, still can have... Um, you know, the Chris brothers, you know, doing their thing in the tag team scene. But this really, you know, had me thinking that, you know, they got big plans from down the road. I mean, I don't know as far as, you know, challenging for any championships. I mean, I'm sure if they want to do this company, it, whomever they want to put the belt on or decide to make be the person, I have faith in this company that they can do that and do it in a way that's believable to us fans. But, uh, yeah, this this was great. And Eddie Edwards always delivers. I really want to see and not not to um, minimize him or you know that I think less of him. For some reason, I want to see Eddie Edwards win the grand championship and have a run with it because I really think he would be an awesome grand champion. Um, I want to say that he's held it, but I might be wrong on that. Um, I thought for some reason he held it for a little while. Did he not? Did the Moose no, not win it off he, him? He, no, that no, was uh, he, he, three. Yeah, he uh um when they in the inaugural match uh about a couple of years ago he had lost to Aaron Rex who won That's it. Right. For some reason it seems like he has held it, but you're quite right. I don't think he has held it. He's challenged a few times, but just come up short. But yeah, I, I think he'd be another one. And I just don't think once again he's main event caliber. And I think to be in that main event, you've got to be someone who can put on a good match, but it can also tell a storyline. And I think Eddie Edwards' big problem is that he just really hasn't got a personality or charisma, not in the same way that Eli Drake has, not even the same way that Davey Richards used to have. Davy Richards was much more of a, a main eventer than Eddie Edwards ever was, in my eyes. Um, just, just because I miss that guy. <laughs> he, he's great, isn't he? And I thought he retired to go and become a doctor or something like that, but I think he still wrestles, doesn't he? I'd like to see him back, to be honest. I, I think, you know, I, I think that if he doesn't want to wrestle full time, then I can't see why they don't, you know, put the wolves back together. Maybe Eddie doesn't want to. Is Eddie still um, the, the champion over in Japan at the moment? No, nah, I think I want to say he dropped it a little over a month ago. All right, they, they didn't mention that on Impact, I don't think. But um, yeah, so anyway, the, I thought the match was good, and the, you know these guys, you know, really put on a fantastic, hard-fought match. And uh, we'll come on to the ending in a minute. But you said something about you think they're going to have a big ideas for Sammy Callahan. My question to you is: you've already mentioned Moose, but after Impact and Alberto have played out and whatever happens with Eli uh, is obviously going to be those four people are most probably going to be in the main event. So that's Eli, Alberto, Impact and Austin Aries. Who do you think they'll be building up next to be the, the next one to challenge? Do you think it's going to be someone from outside the company? Do you think it will be someone like Congo Kong? What, 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 any thoughts at this point? Well, I think what they're going to have to do, is we're going to see a combination. I think they're going to have to have maybe six or seven guys, Kay. And, because, you know, say you put the belt on Moose, okay? All right, you already knew he know he's going to face Eli, he's going to face Alberto, and then, you know, um, I guess Impact, okay? What they're going to have to do, they're going to have to integrate new guys into it because we can't have, all right, we put the belt on him and it's just the same people challenging for the belt. So if I was going to say, just say, for example, with Callahan, if him in the main event scene, say, like he has a title match, that's somewhere down the road. I'm looking at maybe, we'll say like September. I'm just throwing a month out there. 
So, I mean, I don't know because I even think Brian Cage, I could see them going that route with him. It's just, I don't know, with this company, I feel like the, the creative is easy for them to get behind somebody when they really commit to like, hey, we want to give this guy this type of push, you know, because I've seen it before where guys who I would have never thought win, win the, uh, the world title and end up winning the world title. So, um, I mean, it remains to be seen, you know, we, I mean, right now we got our main eventers that we got now. But I mean, when you have matches like like this, where you're showcasing Callahan in this light, I I think it's beneficial, and you know, it gives creative an idea of what to do with him moving forward. You know, maybe to like pull that trigger and say, hey, let's give this guy a shot. You know, put him in this. I think in Callahan's case, I would like him to go maybe the mid card route. You know, maybe mix it up, and you know, maybe win the grand championship. You know, and have some type of feud with that before he moves on to the main event. Yeah, well, we'd like to hear your thoughts, by the way, uh, as you're listening to this. Let us know who you think the next uh, main event challenger is going to be, out with the, the four that seem to have been challenging for a long time. Is there anyone that you think can step up to the plate and actually be a legit contender? Please let us know. Now, you just mentioned about a mid-belt title for these guys. I think that although I like what they're doing with Matt Seidel, I think that there's been a, a bit of not bad booking, but... By the fact they've put the Grand Championship on him, to me, it seems like they've got two X Division titles now, if that makes sense. It, the, he just seems like such an X Division wrestler that he's turned that belt into almost like another X Division as opposed to a proper secondary title. And I think that's been a mistake with booking, and it's, they're going to have to address that at some point. Um, the, I just, I just, it doesn't sit well with me. They need another title for the KMs, the Braxtons, the Callahans of this world, which they don't seem to have at the moment. So, well, well I, I think, not sorry to cut you off, but I think that is the belt. I think it's just is in. I think here is the downside when you talk about a mid card belt, is because you know in the past the X Division belt it was, it was always that was essentially the mid card belt, but you know they said it's no limits. I think when you have a mid card belt, you know, normally you're having, you know, guys of, you know, heavyweight, you know, or larger status challenging for it. You don't get, you know, too many um cruiserweights challenging for it. And you know, the the X division nowadays is pretty much a cruiserweight division. The guys who 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 uh carry the title are cruiserweights, uh Seidel a cruiserweight. That doesn't mean they can't move up the card, but you know, that it is what it is. Same thing with Austin Aries. You know, you can, you know, every now and then put uh, a big title on a smaller guy but just get behind him i i mean i i think sidell's been fine i mean i think that's cool i i do think eventually once he drops the grand championship i think he'll probably have some x division title run down the road i mean it's crazy he hasn't had it already but i mean you know i i guess i don't see it like that but you know our opinions differ that's all right yeah, no, don't get me wrong. I think he's done well with the title and it's well deserved. But, you know, uh, and you never know, next week he might be ex division champion as well. That's what we don't know. But um, the, the point I'm trying to make is that since they turned the X Division into a cruiserweight title, as you said, you know, because when you think back to some of the days, you know, something Samoa Joe held, didn't he, uh, as an example, um, you're quite right. It does feel like much more of a cruiserweight title at the moment. And I, I just think they need a proper mid card belt and being a mid-card champion and an EC3 was a terrible mid-card champion but you look back to you know WWF I'm not going to say WWE I'm going to say WWF you know when Rick Rude was uh, intercontinental champion or or when uh, Ultimate Warrior was was intercontinental champion you didn't think them as lesser than the world champion you just thought of them as awesome people carrying around an awesome belt uh, and I think that's what impact haven't done very well over the years the secondary belts have never felt that important the x division did uh when that was the secondary belt but since it's gone down the the, the cruiserweight route it doesn't feel that important anymore but anyway um uh, I, as you said we can agree to disagree although I, i'm not even remember what we're disagreeing on at this point <laughs> <laughs> right okay back to the baseball back to the face um we didn't we saw it very very quickly and then it cut away to Sammy Callahan looking like, oh shit, what have I just done uh, for a few seconds before uh, going to the end of the match? But uh, what did you think of the spot? You know, I got mixed feelings on it because on one end, it's wrestling. Things are going to happen. Like, I know there's that crowd where it's like, man, that was stupid. Why did he do it? Because I know Jim Cornette went on a rant and, you know, a lot of people were agreeing with him. 
but I kind of compare it to like you think about when uh, somebody does a dive from over, you know, a suicide dive or a plancha from over the top rope and say, uh, and, and um, I'm trying to think of who, who that happened to. One time the person didn't catch the person and the person doing the uh, plancha fell like right on their butt, you know, and it kind of uh, took the wind out of them. So things happen. So like I understand it, but then too, I, I, I like to believe just moving forward, you know, with a risk like that, especially when you're talking about with a bat, um, I'd like to see them limit things like that because here's the thing. If you go the fake route, and what I mean fake route is, you know, and I had mentioned where uh, El Patron had hit Moose with a, a rubber trash can and, you know, Moose sold it like gold, but, you know, it's a rubber trash can. You're going to get the criticism like, well, that doesn't even look real and stuff. But then when you use, you know, a real bat or something that looks real, you know, this is what happens. So I just I think moving forward, just, you know, with something like that, kind of, you know, think better of it. Because the margin for error for I, I see what he was trying to pull off, but I just thought with the margin, the margin that, of, for error for so that particular um, stunt is so steep where, you know, one wrong thing and, you know, you end up getting what we got. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, I mean, it did look like he caught him a cracker uh, full force. And yeah, I, I didn't really see what they were trying to achieve at the spot. I don't think if it had gone down as planned, I don't think we'd have really been that bothered by the move. You know, we've just gone, oh, well, it's just, a, you know, a typical chair shot kind of thing. You know, we, we would have thought, man, that was brutal. <laughs> but because of what actually happened, we're now thinking, bloody hell, that was sick. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I didn't like the, the, the whole section. And, yeah, lots of room for error. And unfortunately, he managed to find that room for the error. But... Um, Fair play to, to Eddie for finishing the match and getting out of Dodge. Um, I'm glad they didn't show the, the repercussions of it. Uh, but there you go. What can you do? I, I'm trying to think of some famous spots of where people missed. Uh, I think The Undertaker had a famous one against Shawn Michaels, didn't he, at WrestleMania, where he did a, a suicide dive over the top and basically landed on his head. And, and obviously uh, Brock Lesnar versus Kurt Angle at WrestleMania, he did a, a shooting star press and landed on his head as well. Was another there was there. a spot, the spot that I'm thinking about where it comes to mind, it was, uh, I think, R-Truth in The Miz, R-Truth had went for a plancha one time, and uh, it wasn't, I, mean, I don't know, but pretty much the guy didn't catch, uh, they didn't catch R-Truth, so when R-Truth went for the plancha, he literally fell and hit all mat, and it, you know, took him, you know, took him out, he was winded, and then, <laughs> speaking of R-Truth, another scenario where he was going for a slap, and he literally popped a uh, DiBiase's son and dazed him in the ring so you know things happen in wrestling but I think when you're talking about stunts like this um you know I, I like to see less of it because so much can go wrong there's little room for error it, you know a last one I'll bring up is you know sometimes when um when they do the uh chair to the throat that's another one too I mean you know you it's easy. It's easy, it's easy to mess up. So, and you know, he you could tell he was remorseful and he played it off well. And um, you know, hopefully, just moving forward, I'm sure these guys will probably continue to feud. They can feud off of this. But uh, yeah, just moving forward, I just hope Impact is just careful with some of the, you know, the uh, angles they try to pull. I remember a couple of other ones, just TNA ones. Um, I think Ken Anderson a chair shot to Jeff Hardy, or was it the way around? But one of them got busted open. With, with a, a loose chair shot. And another one that I was at the taping of uh, when we had the British boot camp, you had Marty Skirl try to do a suicide dive over the top of the turnbuckle to the outside. And once again, no one caught him. <laughs> he just basically went headfirst into the railings uh, because no one was there to stop him. So that was about three, four years back when Rockstar sped one. But anyway, uh, yeah, I won't ask the question, what was your favourite move that went wrong? But uh, you can let us know if you want. But that, that's really quite a horrible question to ask. Right. Um, yeah, so overall, it was a really good show. Something completely different with regards to the main event. Um, and as we said, they've, they've built up next week's uh, crossroads to be something really exciting. Yeah, um, I'll run down the card for you guys. Just for you who might not know, we're going to get title versus title match with X Division and the Grand Championship titles will both be on the line with Ishimori, who's the X Division champion, defending against my, Matt Seidel, who's the Grand Champion, who will also be defending. Then we're getting a tag team title match with LAX defending their 
Impact Tag Team titles against the Cult of Lee. We're going to get a knockouts title match between uh, champion Laurel Van Ness and Allie. And then we're going to also get OVE versus Lashley and Edwards. And I guess this version of OVE is just going to be the Chris Brothers. I don't think that Callahan's involved. Uh, I would have liked this to be a, a handicap match, but you know, that's fine. And then our main event's going to be Austin Aries defending the Impact World title versus Johnny Impact. So excellent card on our hands. Absolutely, and really looking forward to it. So I think that's it for, for this week, unless there's anything else you wanted to, to throw out there. No, just great show. Um, you know, Impact keeps delivering, man. It's, uh, you know, they're giving us must-see television. I'm literally finding myself every week, you know, like, can't wait to see next week. So good job by Impact Wrestling. Absolutely. And that's it for us this week. Uh, don't forget to hit that subscribe. We want to get up to 4,000 uh, subscribers on YouTube. So please do make sure you hit that button and uh, make sure to check out the other content, which is uploaded most days, if not every day. And uh, if you're only going to listen to one other thing this week, make sure you go back and listen to that Eli Drake interview, because as I said, it really is eye opening about the whole art of the wrestling business and why Eli Drake has uh, got over so well over the last few years. All right. Uh, that's it from me. Take care, Ro. And we'll catch you next week. Bye. All right. Take, take care.